Darwin used the power of observation, observation of many, many species that he observed through his trips on the HMS Beagle, looking at the life forms in South America and the Galapagos Islands, comparing the flightless birds of Australia, Africa, and South America, whether it was looking at the tortoises, finches, and iguanas on the Galapagos, or his studies at home in England of beetles and barnacles. It is this understanding that led him to the theory of evolution based on survival of the fittest, which is the understanding that natural selection occurs in this process. Today, however, we have much greater technology that allows us to look deeper into how the species are connected. So let us look at some of the evidence that we use to prove Darwin's theory of evolution. Of course, in the 1800s, Darwin had no concept of DNA or how DNA functioned to produce the proteins that make us up and, make, and compare the species through this method. However, today we can take the genome, the genetic breakdown of any species and compare it to any other. So when we look at the DNA, if we can compare the DNA in such a way that we can show that each species or some species have similar DNA and similar makeup of those chromosomes, we can show that there must be common ancestry. That is one of the reasons that we say the chimpanzee is probably one of the most closely related species to mankind. We share 98.6% the same DNA. And as we've talked about before, we understand that while we may have the same DNA, not all of it gets activated. Some of it is hidden in the recessive mode, not, not activated because our, our needs for our environment do not require that those genes are turned on. So even though we have 98.6% the D same DNA showing that we have a common line of descent, we are not exactly the same. Another way we look at the same genetic understanding is if we look at the biochemistry. From that DNA we know that we build proteins. So if we can show from that DNA that similar proteins are shared by the species, we can assume, we can put into effect the understanding that those species must have some relationship. So if they have that same relationship, they must have common ancestry. They must have a common line of descent. Their development through time must share a common path. We can also look at what is called the structural development of species. This is called the study of homology. So if we look at different skeletal functioning here, we understand that the human, the horse, the cat, the bat, the bird, and the whale, which are all animals and all vertebrates, and all of them except the bird are mammals, we all have similar skeletal similarities. So we have in the human this upper arm bone, the horse has an upper bone, the cat, the bird, the whale, and even the bat. We also have two bones that make up the forelimb. And then we have the appendages of our hand, the horse's hoof, the cat's paw, the bat's wing, the bird's wing, and the whale's fin. All of these bone structures show that because we have common use and common functioning, of this mechanism, this skeletal mechanism, there must be some type of common descent, line of development that shows common ancestry. So when we study the skeletal makeup, the organs of the body, if we can show that they have any similarity, there must be some common line of descent. Another way that we sh look at for common ancestry is by studying embryology, the embryologic development of the organism before birth. So here we have a fish, a rabbit, and a gorilla. And if we go back to the origination of the developing embryo, 
it is very similar in shape and structure. And then it is not until later in its developmental pattern that we see the changes that lead to the actual fish, rabbit, or gorilla. So if we can show that the development before birth is similar, we can assume there is a common line of development and therefore a common line of descent. And we can show that there is some form of common ancestry. Now we know that Darwin used the fossil record because he studied the work of Cuvier and Lyell. But today we can take that even a step further because now we have the technology to actually use the chemical makeup of these fossils to show common development and common line of descent. We can date these fossils more accurately using things like carbon dating or radioactive decay and understanding the actual age of these fossils. Remember things like earthquake shifts and floods carry fossils from area to area, so we can't depend simply on the where the strata of the earth are and date them by the age of the layers of the earth. So today we use a much deeper understanding of the fossil record using the chemical makeup of the fossils and actually creating a more accurate timeline of the development of the species. So over here on the right we have Homo sapiens which is us. But if we look at the gorilla we see that there are similarities to the development of the bone structure using the fossil remains all the way back to Australopithecus a million years ago. So because we have a common development of the patterns of our fossils we know that there must be some form of common sharing of our line of descent and therefore from that information we gather that data to find that there is common ancestry. One of the most fascinating understandings is how do new species occur? This process is called speciation. We know that species are still developing and new species are still forming on the earth. For instance, we have the spotted owl. Now while these two owls are genetically exact, they no longer interact and will not breed. They do not recognize each other as common mates. So because they will not breed, create a new offspring, viable offspring, they are considered separate species. So if you take the Mexican spotted owl found in the parts of southwestern the United States and Mexico, and then you look at the northern spotted owl found throughout the northern regions of California, Washington, and Oregon up into southern Canada, these two owls are exactly the same genetically, but because they will not breed, they will not form an offspring, they are considered two separate species. This also holds true to a species called the California golden salamander. Each of these is an exact genetic identical uh, salamander. But because where they live, their genes have been activated in so many different varied ways based on the environment, whether they live in the desert, whether they live in a lush tropical uh, forest, whether they live where there's lots of rain, depending on the rainfall, the surroundings, they are so different, they are so visibly different that they no longer recognize each other as uh, organisms that share common species so each of these is a separate species of what is called the California golden salamander. Because they will not breed, because they do not recognize each other, they will not interact to form a new organism. And if they will not breed to form a new organism, they are completely new species. So this evolution, based on the environments they live on, creates new species and this shows us that evolution is still in effect and still taking place all over the world.